Welcome, everybody, to another episode. This is a very exciting episode. We have uh, Sarah and uh, Siki, who is the the master fundraiser. Um, and what we wanted to do was a, a little special episode on um, fundraising and um, how uh, Siki has been able to fundraise, um, uh, what his strategy is, um, and uh, wanted to kind of kick it off to, to him and and we'll me and Sarah or we'll definitely put it in our two cents and well, I've, maybe I, I, I've ra I've raised quite a bit of money as well but Siggy how much how much have you have yeah. you raised uh, uh um, in your career I think just over 120 million okay and, and maybe you can break down like was this all for one company or multiple companies I this is across four companies as CEO and three as a founder so a total of four I guess Okay. Yeah. So what what is what is your like now that you've gone I don't know, maybe take us through like the evolution of like you your first fundraises and then up until now and like give kind of the listeners like kind of the the, the secrets that you ultimately came to in your final fundraise. Well, I hope it won't be our final fundraise yet. Of course, we're going to probably still going to raise more money. No, no, no. But I mean, number one. I, 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 I mean, just, yeah, I mean, just, I mean, I mean, I mean, just, just, just like what, what, what you've learned over, over that, that amount of time. Yeah. Maybe I'll just go through sort of the fundraising history a little bit. Um, so in 07, I started my first company um, and we raised. I think it was $5 million, I believe, from Lightspeed. Um, and then we sold that company to Zynga. And then at the second company, we raised $7 million from General Catalyst and a bunch of angels. And then I joined a company called Sandbox, and we raised, uh, while I was there, $68 million um, from Andreessen and uh, as well as some investors in Hong Kong called Gopi. And then for runway today, we've raised another 33. Um, and so all in was just under 120, I think. Uh, and yeah, over the course of that journey, I mean, the first one, you know, we had a product that was already working. So maybe like that's 10 number one, have something that actually already works. So that's probably the easiest possible way to raise. And maybe that's a useful caveat for all this advice I'm going to give. Like there is nothing to replace the distraction and a good product. Right. Right. Um, this is, this advice is on the basis of all else being equal. You have a working product or a not working product. How do you maximize your success of fundraising? Um, because none of this is going to help if you don't even have something that is worth investing in that could work. Um, but over the course of those raises, uh, there's some first principles frameworks that I put into place that I tested out and I found it to be highly effective and also pretty counterintuitive um, and sort of contradictory to what you're going to find online. And so the way I think about fundraise, there's sort of like three big components here. Um, I break it down to the mindset process and the pitch itself. Um, and so Ultimately, what you're trying to do in fundraise, I consider it a business transaction, right? This business transaction is like any other business transaction. It's a marquee clarity price. And your goal as an entrepreneur is to maximize your chances of closing this transaction at the best possible price. And so like any other transaction is determined by supply and demand. So the question is, how do you maximize your demand and minimize your supply to get that maximum Theory price. So that's like at a high level, my framework is. And so the three parts of this is one mindset. I think it really starts with this. So the default for people raising is that the person across the table from me is Mr. Money Bags, right? And <laughs> or Mrs. Money Bags or Mrs. Money Bags, right? Um, and it is y your job in this meeting to get Mrs. Money Bags to give you a bag of money. 
And if she doesn't give you a bag of money, then you're fucked. That's not work, right? And so that's a default mindset. And that is not a winning mindset. People do not want to invest in that kind of thing. I think the winning mindset and frankly, the more accurate mindset when I'm entering into one of these meetings is that the person that crosses the table for me has a much harder job in this meeting than I do. Because it's her job in this meeting to sell me a liquid US dollar. And her liquid US dollar will buy the same shit as everyone else's liquid US dollar. And it's my job in the meeting to figure out why it's her liquid US dollar that I'm going to purchase. And when I'm paying for that liquid US dollar, it's a one-way ticket to 10x, 100x return pay. And the train is leaving the station with or without. Um, and I think that's true. Like if you, if you put yourself in the shoes of an investor, like what, what is, what is the thing that you're selling? You're selling money. Money is liquid by definition. It's the most liquid commodity on the planet by definition. Um, and so you have to figure out like, what is the differentiated reason of why someone will take your money and not someone else's money. And your job is to give the money to some company so they'll multiply for you. That's your job. Uh, and I, thought, I think it's an actually accurate way of thinking about it. So that is the thing that I have in my head. I never say it, right? But when you think it, people can feel it. And that's the dynamic that's required for a winning deal. Like people can feel it in things big or small. And in, in some, somewhat this feels like a boogie theater, right? Like you would think that this is a completely rational conversation um, in, in a business situation. And it's useful to not think about it because ultimately that's not how people make decisions. People make decisions based on how they feel, not based on facts, which right. is like well, the second part of my framework. But let, we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll start there. I'm curious. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that's so true. I've been, as Kevin knows, and probably all our listeners, I've been doing these intro calls with founders who are raising oh, yeah. and like, the number one thing I do is like hype them up. Like I, yeah. I try to pick out for them, like the parts of their story that are really differentiated. And I'm like, you have a background in this. You are uniquely positioned to do this thing that you're going right. to do. You need right. to highlight that. And I feel like the best kind of pitch feedback you can give someone is hyping them up. So they go into these meetings confident that yeah. They're offering you an opportunity. They're not offering, they're not begging you for money. They're offering you an opportunity. And that opportunity could be offered to someone else just as easily because this is a really amazing, unique opportunity. And like, I, I, I completely agree. I actually got feedback in because I'm a woman. No, I'm not. I, I, I don't actually believe that. I am, I'm a little bit overconfident. So I got feedback through an investor of mine that in one of my pitches, I was like too confident and they didn't like me because they thought I was bragging too much and I wouldn't be able to take feedback. And like, that might be true. I am pretty overconfident mm. at times. Um, but like, I was like, good, I'm on the right track <laughs> because you need to project confidence in these kinds of meetings to get that. Yes. And, and as much as it might turn some people off, it's really the only, like you, if you don't bring that, you won't get any yeses. Totally. I, I think there's nuance to that, right? I think like there's a really fine line between confidence and arrogance, right? Yeah. And ar arrogance is not what you want. And I think like, um, you know, like it is really confident to like be open to feedback and to take feedback, right? Right. Right. Like that is a signal of, of confidence and, and people respect that. And I, you know, that, that was, that took some time for me to calibrate too. Right. Like how, how do you like, if, if you really don't know anything, you haven't done a whole lot, how do you portray an air of confidence while being open? And, uh, it's hard. And this is why it is somewhat can be Kabuki theater. It takes practice, but you can get There's some simple, just stupid tricks. Like instead yeah. of saying no, yeah. and here's why you're wrong. You say yes. And here's why you're wrong. Just simply changing right. the word to right. a yes can, can help you. It cool. make it seem like you're kind of taking the feedback, but then you're also kind of sharing your point. Yeah. Yeah. You say, I always say like, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And here, here's some additional information about it. But, um, I feel like you are the master, uh, at, you know, projecting that confidence and then also, um, seeming approachable at the same time. The learned skill. I, I, I too am. 
uh, pretty urgent a lot of the time. And it's something I, I try to work, work against, uh, in, inside my team too, as well as talking to other people. Um, but it can be learned. You, it can, you can get better and it takes practice. Um, so my, my set is a start. Um, the second part is process. And so how, how do you actually go about raising a rack? Um, if you've done it before as a first time founder, or you've never done it before. And the thing that I observe when I talk to a lot of founders of a fundraise, like they really think it's like this kind of this mysterious, different thing, right? You have to like get advice from people on intro, no offense. Uh, you should definitely <laughs> like get meetings on intro, um, with Sarah uh, and Kevin, but what, what it, it's actually not that mysterious or new. And what makes it click for a lot of founders when I describe it is like, it's literally sales. Like if you're selling yeah. your product, like how do you do it? You prospect, you, 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 you get outreach, you get a connection, you get a meeting and you do the close. It just, it's the same thing. Right? The process is not different. Um, and so if you break it down that way, yeah, like you want, you want to prospect and how do you do that? Um, one of the things that I see first time founders do is like, they go straight to the institutionals that they've heard of, like the Sequoias and Greasons of the world, right? Um, no matter where they are, because they think that's what you're supposed to do. Um, but one of my hacks is ahead of any round that you raise, whether that's like your first, you know, institutional round or your series B, it's also always useful just to do a party round. And this is another yes. thing that I have like a different opinion on than most founders on uh, first time. They tend to be like really protective about their cap table. They don't have it really small and only have yes. like a few people on it. Um, and I think that's silly. Like one of the best definitions of an angel investor I've heard is that it's you're, you're paying people for the privilege of giving them advice, which is like a pretty accurate definition. What, what were you, what's happening when you are closing angel investors is you are adding people on your cap table who can support you and you can use your network and you can get connected to people that otherwise you wouldn't be able to get connected to. Right. Um, and so ahead of around, like opening up a note does a few things. One, it gives you some momentum. It's a breathing room into your balance sheet. And two, you get connected to a large number of people that you can tap for getting your actual round done. And sometimes you might get preempted, which is, you know, how our last round got done, which I'll have you be happy to tell the story about. Um, I'm going to use any like platform for that. To uh, yeah, sure. uh, we use, uh, I'm an investor in a company called get cabal and cabal is just like a really amazing way of managing your network of advisors and investors. Like you can tap your network, search for any leads that you have. Um, that's one source. Um, for investor sourcing, Signal is a pretty good way of doing it. Um, I use uh, Signal from NFL. What about like managing all the cap table entities, uh, like in a party round? Like, do you uh, have them all come in on an SPV or how do you? Yeah, and that's a great question. That's a super fantastic question. So um, thanks for teaming that up because the reason why um, I assume you asked is because you have a lot of people in the cap table. To get anything done, you have to get like a million signatures. And that is legitimately painful. And so the hack is anyone under like 50 or 25K, you should put them into what's called a roller vehicle mm -hmm. list. And what that Range does little, is yeah. people from the investor company. Yeah. Uh, but you just, it's just one signature it's yours to get anything done on behalf of the smaller investors. Uh, and that should be the basic station for a smaller check. And that's a way to make it manageable. Great question. Yeah, we had um, in our, one of our earliest rounds, an investor put, our deal, our company on AngelList as a SPV, and they kind of rolled up a ton of smaller investors that way. Um, and then they just opened it up. So people like saw Winnie on AngelList and invested, uh, which was cool because I, I kind of got that party round without even realizing oops, I was doing it. I, I probably would have like opted out if I had known what they were going to do. But uh it was cool and like yeah, it is just one entity on my cap table, yeah. which is nice, but it like includes hundreds of investors in that. Yeah, that is so convenient. Um so yeah, back to process. So the way I think about this is how do you maximize your supply as your demand and minimize your supply? And so in terms of supply, it's actually relatively simple. So just imagine like you're looking at two companies, right? One company says, 
we're raising $2 million on a $10 million pre and we're halfway there. We have a million dollars that's committed. You're like, okay, cool. Another company goes to you and says, we're raising $1 million on a 10 million pre and we're already oversubscribed. For some reason, the second company just sounds way better, but they're right. actually in the exact right. same situation. Um, and one of the truths of the fundraising is rounds are e either oversubscribed or never close. Right. So there's like a bunch of yep. advantages to actually like raising a little bit less than you think you want, because you can always be oversubscribed one. And two is what I found is that during the early, the later stages, like the B's and C's of the world, what you're asking for actually prices like, uh, firms immediately out. Right. So there's firms who can only write like sub 10 million dollar checks, for example. So if you ask for yep. 15, they're like, well, it's not my kind of deal. Um, and that's not in your favor because you'd rather have a term sheet than no term sheet. Um, at some price. Um, so that's all you really have to really know about supply. The demand side is more interesting. Um, so the way I think about it is like, how do you maximize your demand? And one of the ways that's unappreciated is like it's a concentration of your demand. So let's say you have access to like 12 investors. There's a world of difference between meeting with those investors, like one every month over the course of a year versus meeting all 12 in like two days, right? you're inherently concentrating that demand in time versus space. Right. Um, and so this is why the, the, the advice of you should all either be raising full time or not be raising at all is like really good. That's kind of the economic reason why it makes sense because you don't want to dilute your demand over an extended period of time. Um, so you want to meet with as many investors in as short a time as possible. What do you say to the thing? I, I know my answer, but I'm curious of yours. You know, yeah. investors always say, oh, but we like to get to know founders way in advance of raising, of them raising. It's so important to us. That's their viewpoint. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's their job, right? Their job is to talk to founders and learn as much about what you're doing and the market. So then they report up to the general partners to say like, here's why you pay my salary because I'm, my nose is on the ground. Um, is that really why you invest? No, they, they invest in things because like it's their rate, a company is raising and it's incredibly attractive. It's taking off. Like, that's and, they, and they think that they're going to miss out. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, that is why. So, you know, it, the, the psychology makes sense, right? Wow. Someone's reaching out. They're super interested in my company and I don't want to offend them if I don't take their meeting. And like, basically none of that's true. Well, like if, if, if you run a good process and you're doing something great and it's growing, like they will invest whether they've met you before or not. That is just, it's just, it's a true statement. Um, so I, I would, I would say. I wouldn't, if, if it's like taking, so I do currently meet with investors and I tell them straight out the reason why I meet with them is because if you want to get to the next round, introduce us to your portfolio company. So you get to learn more about runway. We get to grow our ARR and we get to develop a relation that way. But if you want to just like shoot the shit and like every quarter and not like help us get a customer, then you know, where, where we don't really have time for it. Um, that's like one. That's good smart. One. That is Thank smart. For businesses that, that yeah. sell to other venture backed businesses, that's a really good strategy. Um, what, what, so, what, yeah. what, what do you think about, like, obviously like you, you have an amazing network, you, you have a great track record now over the four rounds that you've done, like for a lot of the, our listeners that are first time founders, like, how do you, how do you build that network up? Um, how do you get that f very first check? How how do you create that scarcity and that FOMO that they are going to miss out on, on that round? Yeah, I mean, this, I think we're going to jump head to the pitch, but you have to have like a really good pitch and you have to have a really good product and idea that you're working on, right? It starts with that. And then what you want to do is you want to build momentum, right? Get, get to a one person who's really here to story who you can get excited. And if that person is someone like who's connected or is, you know, someone who knows a lot of investors, even someone like me, then that'll open a lot of doors. Like if I, I've invested in many, many first time founders before because they had a compelling background and they did something interesting. Uh, and once I'm on the cap table, I'll introduce them to everyone I know. 
You want to invest in my my open round right now, Siki? Absolutely. Tell me docs. All um, right. That's binding. Yeah, that's binding. <laughs> So that's that's how you usually do. It. I mean, that's that's ultimately um, well. The way I did it is like I would build something that was already working, right? And people started reaching out. So like that's probably the best possible way to do it. Um, but short of that, find 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 the one person who can get you connected, and that person then then your network goes viral, right? That person knows other people, and you build on that person's network too. Well, it's also in their best in interest, right? Like like. If somebody's go going to invest, say, say that they're they're the first check in, like it's their in in their best interest to intro you to other people because they want you, they want their money to actually be worth something. Like I think that um, what what I've definitely learned is that, and I've I've actually like James Bashar, former founder of Tilt. Um, he had a crowdfunding platform and he's like, as soon as you, you can get over 33% of the round, you basically tilt. And, and and so you need to really try to get there. And then the round just kind of everybody like yeah. can now believe that you're able to actually close this round. Yeah. Critical mass is a real thing. That's pretty good advice. I mean, you know, going back to the first time founder question, treat it like sales, right? Like you're starting a company, you need to sell a thing. And oh, I think if you haven't sold a thing before, it can seem really daunting, right? Um, how, how do I get in front of these people? How do I close? But if you think about it as sort of the first test of your ability to be a founder, which is like you need to sell someone something. And what you're selling at the start is an idea on yourself. How do you get in front of your prospects? How do you close? What is a winning message? That is the right way to think about it. And if you can't close like the first person, whether that's an engineer or investor, then it's, be, it's not going to get easier over time to sell the thing. Um, and so having a growth mindset around this is actually a really useful skill that is very powerful for me that I need to get good at. It's probably the most helpful thing to have. You go to this. Um, so going back to the process, if you think about how you sell a product, right? You, you prospect, you have a large list of leads. You would do the same thing here. You use signal or go on a uh, crunch face. So when I was fundraising for sandbox in 2018, that was a really tough one. Um, I've, I did two companies before. Um, so I had somewhat of a leg up, but if you imagine what 2018 was like, right, this was when VR was, it was called a VR winter. So Sandbox is a virtual reality company. And in 2018, nobody was investing VR. And also traditionally VCs don't like to invest in content companies, companies that make games. They also don't like to invest in car hardware companies because that's yeah. very capital intensive. And also retail companies where you go out to a store and you buy something is not considered a venture capital business. So there I was, and also you don't tend to invest in uh, international companies. And this is a company that was founded in Hong Kong. So there I was fundraising for a VR company building games that had a hardware component that had all of its money, uh, revenue from coming from retail stores down in Hong Kong in 2018. I, I thought basically this is going to be a impossible raise. We're not going to raise. So we put together a list of 400 some investors, anyone who has ever invested in any kind of a game or store or VR, anything. And that list was about 400 people. Uh, and I made two columns on this list. One column was how likely are they to, are they going to invest? And no one was above like 5%. And the right. other column was how important are they to the company? Um, and then we have three tranches. Basically the first tranche is people I thought were going to invest no matter what, like just people who are really excited about the team or the idea. The second tranche is people who we didn't particularly care about, but also people that we didn't know. So this is like the, you know, sort of practice tranche. And the third tranche is people really, really, really wanted to invest. 
and you kind of just go in that order. Um, so with the first crunch, you get advice from presumably friendlies and you get some momentum. Maybe you get some money in the bank. Maybe you get a term sheet or two. And a second crunch of people, you, um, you have more momentum. And by the time you get to the third tranche of people you actually want to really talk to, you have all the momentum in the world. Maybe it's already oversubscribed and you practice the crap out of your pitch already. And it's as good as it's ever going to get. That's, I think, the right order to run a process. Um, so I think this is a nice segue to the pitch part. But one of the key questions that people ask is like, during this process, how do you actually iterate on your pitch? How do you make it better? Because right. the most frequent complaint that you hear from founders is, I had a great meeting with some investor. They said great things. They were really excited. Then they ghosted me. They never told me why they weren't going to invest. They're always going to be in every single pitch. Most investors are always at the end excited. And it's only when they actually commit that they actually like it. That, that's, that, that's the only thing that matters. Yeah, like you don't know, it's not done until the money is in a bank, right? And one of the limits tests of like um, a early or first line founder is they're excited by these meetings, right? <laughs> right. They send an investor. Yeah. Like, we, we met with this investor and they were like, they said such good things. The energy was so great, right? And I, you look at that, a second time founder is like, oh boy. It's like, it's, it's everything that's not like, here's a term sheet, isn't it? That's, that's the right translation of, of what you've yep. heard. Um, and that's hard, right? Because they seem excited and they seem emotional. And of, for, of course they do. That's kind of their job. Um, and anyway, going back to uh, how do you iterate on your pitch and make it better? Um, the, the, the trick here is actually investors will always tell you why they're not investing if you know how to listen for it. And my hack here is the reason why they didn't invest is the first question that they asked. That's why they didn't invest. And so the popular misconception of questions is that they are an indication of interest. I believe that they are an opposite. They are a pointer to an objection that they were holding in your head while they were waiting for you to patiently stop talking. That's what a question is. Right. So a real life example in my second time around, um, one of our first investor meetings for our seed round, the question came up of like competition. How do you think about competition? seems like a really competitive space. At that moment, I knew we lost it because right, I knew that right. they were thinking about competition the entire time I was talking and I could say anything that I wanted, but they already like decided that this is competitive. So before my next meeting, I added a slide very early in the deck. I said, this is a very competitive space. And here's why we're doing what we're doing still. The question never came up again. Right. And so the process of iterating your pitch can be boiled down to basically the systematic removal of all questions until there is only one question left. And that's the only good question you want to hear in an investment pitch, which is how can I invest? That's it. Um, so, so side, that's like question, side, side question, do, do you, um, for your strategy, do you uh, try to pitch the uh, investors to get, because typically investors think like very similar, similar similarly, um, do you try to pitch, um, and obviously you try to keep a very tight window, do you try to pitch the people that are less likely for, to invest to get these objections away so you can actually iterate your pitch so for the pe people who you actually want to invest that you have all these qu these questions answered um i find that the questions will just come through volume rather than like people who are less likely to invest the the the, the nuanced thing about people who are less likely to invest is that they will ask questions but their questions are going to be pretty different from the people who actually do want to invest like what I found about like the different tiers of investors, you know, like investors don't like it, but you know, people put them into different tier tier ones and tier twos and tier threes. Yeah. Um, is the different tiers, they would, they'll ask completely different questions. Like the lower tier investors, they'll ask about like, what are your actual economics today and your margin, even as a seed company, like show me your business plan, your financial forecast. And the tier one investors will find that 
like they care a lot less about that. They know it's at the early stages, you don't really have much and it doesn't matter. It's going to change anyway. And your financial forecasts are all. What they care about is like more of the qualitative things. Like what are you going to do? And what does the world look like when you, when you do it, when this is one of the largest companies in the world and what is the path there? That's what they really care about. Right. Um, so they tend to ask different questions. I don't know. You get the same signal. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I think that's great. Do you, do you do any, um, pitching to other entrepreneurs to get their feedback before, uh, you actually go and start pitching or do you just start with pitching investors and getting their feedback? Um, and all, all of that stuff. And also, um, how, uh, do you actually create your pitch and your deck and all of that stuff? I'm sure that's what people would love. To yeah. Yeah. So the first question, yes. Um, if I have existing founders and mushroom with cash shave, I'll for sure get their feedback first. Um, as part of a raising ahead of an institutional round, getting a party around ahead of it, you'll be pitching a lot of founders by the nature of like having it be party around and a lot of founders that you know investors. So you get feedback that way too. So that's another reason why you want to get a party round going ahead of an institutional round. There was a popular tweet um, from Catherine Boyle. Her, her Twitter is KTM Boyle. She's a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Um, and she said like, you know, founders will often ask, should I use a deck or do you just want me to talk? And her point is like, do what is best for telling the story. And you should have a strong opinion on yeah. that. You should know how, how you're going to best present your pitch to investors. And if it is without a deck, then fine. But for most people, that's actually with a deck. Um, and therefore, like, don't ask, just pull up the deck if that's how you present best. Uh, and I thought that was like, such good advice. I remember going into some meetings and they like wouldn't have a projector. And like, I had my pitch, I had my deck. So what we actually started doing was like, we brought, what did we end up bringing? We brought like a mini projector to some meetings that we w knew, like we just pitch it better when we can show the slides and like it works and that's what we've practiced. And so we ended up bringing the equipment so that we would be prepared and we had the different adapters. Yeah. So like, there was no way that we weren't going to show the slides like every every pitch we were going to do the same thing that worked uh, that we had rehearsed and i think that's that's just such good advice don't be thrown off by like the format that the vc has their conference room like do what works for you and what you've practiced well, yeah i that's advice i also give a lot there are no rules in fundraising no right like i've done it i've i raised rounds with no deck um and 30 slides 10 slides, uh, there are, there are no rules. Do what works, right? Your job is to close. Um, so that's a really good segue into the, the pitch. Okay. So my two main frameworks about the pitch is one, how do people actually make decisions, uh, in investing? And I talked to Mano Coastal one time, I asked him how he makes investment decisions his, his one word answer with emotion, right. which I thought was the most honest answer I've heard from the investor. Um, people don't make any kind of decision based on facts. They make it based on emotion and investors are no exception. So you want to figure out what delivers emotion. The second part of this is like, if you were to theory evaluate an investment rationally, how would you do it? And one way to do it is break it down into two components. One is what is the likelihood of success percentage terms? And if successful, how big is the outcome? Right. And presumably multiply the two to get some kind of expected value. Um, and what I found is that the term that dominates is the second term. It's the size of outcome if successful. And there's many reasons for this, right? Like there is the existence of power law, right? So the nature of venture right, right. is makes it so that if you invest a hundred companies, maybe like three, two or three of them are going to return your entire fund many times over. So you have to like, make sure you don't pass on those three companies. Right. Cause what happens to the other 90 really basically almost doesn't matter. Um, and then from the career perspective. You know, imagine like you're a career investor working at some fund. You invest in a Stripe or an Uber one time, you're forever the Stripe or an Uber guy or gal. Like, that's just how it works. So 
every possible psychological motivation is for you to not be able to pass on a company that could be one of those companies. Um, so this is why the second term dominates. And so your job, if you combine those two facts, is to tell kind of a story, some kind of story. And story is humanity's time-tested way of delivering emotion to other people. Right. Telling a story of how you, the company, goes from where you are today to becoming one of the largest companies in the world. That's basically the pitch. So when I sketch out what my pitch looks like, I think about it explicitly in terms of a story. And this story needs to deliver an emotional arc. And the particular emotional arc I try to sketch out is as follows. It starts with amusement, then it leads to curiosity, then it goes to surprise, then it goes to awe, and then the final emotion is greed. That's like the journey I want to take people on. So amusement, I start with that because I want them to know that if, even if they learn nothing, that they will at least be entertained, even if they decide to not invest and learn nothing. So they really? should pay attention. And then that leads to curiosity, which is, hey, they might actually learn something very valuable, very, very valuable, interesting. And usually in a pitch, it's interesting to listen to because it's some kind of insight that some founder has seen that is so valuable, they're willing to devote the next few years of their life to. So it's usually worth listening to. So then that curiosity leads to surprise, which is, wow, this is actually a really valuable insight. And that surprise leads to awe because if this is a valuable insight and X, Y, and Z happens in the next course of a few years, oh my God, this could be one of the largest companies on the planet. And if that's the case, I have to invest, which leads to greed. So that's still sort of the arc. Um, and to tell a story, I would actually like literally write the story in prose. And the story that I like to use and I advise the companies I work with use is a three act play. Uh, and to back up a bit, it is explicitly not a 10 slide template. And I'm going to go on as little side quest here and ranting about the 10 slide Sequoia template that you can find online because that's a default. Everyone Googles like, what is a pitch template? And they find the 10 slides. It's like problem, opportunity, competition. Um, and my belief is that that is like the worst format to use because if you trace back the ancestry of that template, it always goes back to Sequoia or Fanderson. And their incentive is to filter out the worst companies and invest only the best as fast as they can. And that's probably the right template for that incentive. But your job as a founder to, is to get people to invest in your company, no matter what. Right. A, a completely different set of incentives. Um. And so I think you want to tell a story and I've raised uh, in my decks, like at least 30 slides and that each of them have like less than 10 words. Um, and the reason why I have so many slides and each slide has a few words is after sending a lot of the decks by Docsend, the data so says that an investor going through your slides will never spend more than three seconds per slide. That's the average all time is about yeah. two and a half seconds, but. Most of the time, they will almost always go to the end of your entire presentation, no matter how many slides you have. So if you knew that your every investor was going to spend no more than three seconds on a slide, your slides would look really different. Right. And I'll explain how you get there. Um, but I write a story in prose, and the story is a three-act play. So the first act is the origin story. And it's the answer to the following question. Why are you working on what you're working on? How did you come to work on this? Right. And it's literally a story. Imagine like it's a story of you walking down the street one day and you tripped over a rock made out of solid gold. And this rock is invisible to everyone except for you. Like, what were you doing? What was the weather? Like, tell that story. Um, and this roughly corresponds to the problem and opportunity and team slides. You're describing who you are and how, what you were doing, what your background is and what the opportunity is. And you're describing this whole of the universe in such vivid detail that you can already imagine the shape of an object may fill this hole. So that's that one. That's roughly a third of your presentation. During this point, you're, at no point are you talking about your company. At no point are you talking about your product. You're just talking about like what the opportunity is and what, what, what the story is. Yeah. I'll also like add, I, I feel like this is also a point where you don't have to be 100% truthful to mm -hmm. every detail of your origin story. Like you have to pull out the pieces that are going to tell the best story. And remember, they're not spending that much time hearing your story. So just pick out, if you have to kind of alter history a little bit, um, you 
you want to get the main gist across and you want to you want to make it compelling. And so it may not be like this will hold up in a court of law about every single thing that led up to you founding this company. And that's OK. Right. You want to tell a really good story. You definitely yeah. don't want to ever lie. But like and there's a fine line between the two. Right. Um, but so that's like part one. Act two with like the now. And the now roughly corresponds to traction and product. And so here's where you describe the thing that would fill that hole in the universe. And you describe how it's going and should inform metrics. Um, this should actually be like no more than a third of your slide two of, of your, of your deck. The problem is like for most pitches, that's like the entire thing. People leave with talking about what they built and the product. And that's the worst kind of like sales demo, right? When you are selling the product or people who don't know what it's for, what problem it's solving. Um, what you want is opposite of that. When people are so sold on the opportunity and the problem, they're like, oh my God, I felt that. You know, of course that has to exist. And you describe in such vivid detail. By the time you get to part two, which is describing your product, it feel, feels like you're reading it live. It's nothing surprising. They're like, of course, why didn't someone build that yesterday? That's how people should feel. And so you shouldn't really need to spend that much time on the product. Um, and then you talk about your traction, which is like, we build this thing and here's how it's going. The one thing I'll say here is like, everyone tries to overplay their traction, no matter how much traction they have, isn't amazing. And if your goal is to build one of the largest companies in the world, there's no matter of traction that's amazing to you, right? And so I think the right message to send is like, this is our traction, but we're 1%, 0.1% where we want to be. Um, and that's congruent with the measures you're trying to set. That's like part two. That's the most straightforward part. Part three is also the, a third of your pitch. And this is the most important bit. It's the actual thing that you're selling. The first two parts aren't. And part three is how you go from where you are today to inevitably, step by step, becoming one of the largest companies on the planet. That's the thing that people are actually buying. Right. Because if they wanted to buy what you have today, like, then they should just invest in public markets and invest based on traction. People are investing in the future. And, and, and also just a reminder, like to everybody listening, like as, as Siki is already kind of talked about, like VCs are, are thinking about like the power law dynamic, like they're looking to get into the Ubers, the Airbnbs, they're, they're trying to filter out the, all the other companies. You may have a very compelling pitch. You may have good traction. But if you can't actually get that emotional connection, like Vinod said, that like this is going to be like a world changing company, like even if you don't have that traction, um, uh, just getting that uh, emotional response that like this, this is going to be the next X, this is going to be the next uh, NVIDIA <laughs> or so, so something like that, like that, I think that is something that a lot of people don't understand and, and, and the standard like Sequoia 10 uh, deck, pitch deck, it really takes away from a lot of that. Like it really is an emotional response and they need to feel it at the end is like, if I, like it, it, this is like for any partner, like if they invest in the next Uber or Airbnb, like this is going to make their career. And so like you need to make them feel like this, like they are going to miss out on this. And then they also need to, another part, convince their partners of all of this because there's going to be a lot of objections, how this can't work and everything like that. You need to make them feel like, like this is going to be one of their fund returners. And that is really what venture investing is all about. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's what part three is about, right? Like you're telling the story of how you become one of those fund returners. And the story is like so tight. So it feels like inevitable. This will happen and this will happen. And here's how it becomes, becomes that. And that leads to the awe and the ultimately greed. Um, and the limits test. Oh, so a bit, a bit more about this. This is the hardest and easiest part of the pitch simultaneously. It's hard because to tell that as an ambitious story convincingly that's credible is difficult, but it's also easy because it's in the future. It hasn't happened yet. You just need to say the right words in the right sequence in the right, way. right. Um, 
it, in, so it is both hard and easy. The problem though, is that most pitch decks don't spend very much time on this at all. And as founders, it makes sense. Like as founders, we are in the weeds every day on the ground. We're focused on what's happening now. We're focused on what we've already built. That's like 99% of our time, right? But in a pitch that can't be 99% of your time. That needs to be like 30% of your time. And uh, most of it needs to be on like, where are you going with this? And how does this become one of the largest companies in it? And so with that three act structure, the origin story, the now and the future, the limits test for the pitch is at the end of this pitch, you should be able to say with credibility to follow me sentence, which I believe is like the single most effective thing you can say in a pitch, uh, if earned. And that is what we're doing probably isn't going to work, but if it does, it will be one of the largest companies in the world. And so if you break this down in the first half, you're giving up nothing. The first half you're, you're saying what they already know. Most things that they invest in are going to work. And so you gave them absolutely nothing. You're in your social free credibility. Uh, but the more subtle thing is by saying that they're no longer spending all their time thinking about all the ways in which it might not work. You already told them it's not going to work. <laughs> is that a more effective early stage? Like, you know, versus raising like your series B, should you be saying this might not work? Um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, most of this advice is, is effective for seed and a, and a for B, I think you can still say a variation in that, like for B, you're still saying like, you know, for B, you're saying you're going to be a 10, a hundred billion dollar company. Maybe you don't get there. If you fail, maybe you're like a few billion dollars. People will be probably usually happy with that outcome at a B. Yeah. Um, but like, it is useful to have like a really ambitious vision just in general for recruiting, for investors and for execution. Like you want to, so that like, you want to aim high such that even if like you feel, you, you fail halfway, it's still like really successful is a way to think about it. Yeah. Um, but the second half, you're telling them explicitly, we're going to be one of the largest companies in the world. You're supposed to be telling them like, our goal is to same with your goal. We were going to, we're going to aim for that or, or, or bust, um, yep. and bust being, you know, some like still pretty good outcome. Um, and I think that about covers it. That yeah, is most of what I, about bringing. This like, it's amazing to hear this all. I wish I had this, you know, eight years ago. Um, because I had to learn a lot of this through trial and error. Um, but, uh, you know, the part that really resonated and I still, anytime I go through, you know, early founders decks, it's like, there's just way too much on what they've built. Product right. demos, they want to demo their product. I think this especially plagues product minded founders the most. They just love showing off their product, everything they've built. Um, and even the metrics are like, you know, here's what we've achieved. Here's how great our metrics are. You know, there you do have to include some of that, but I would as much as possible, like move all of that to the appendix, you know, leave that for diligence, get people yeah. sold on how big it can be and why you're the person in the team to get it that big um, because of that story that you've told that you make, you know, yourself a really compelling central hero in the story. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the actual product, everything you've built so far will just make what you're doing seem small because it can't possibly be the thing that it's going to be in 10 years. So I just love to like, look at these decks and then cut, cut, cut everything that's describing their current product as it exists today. Totally. Yeah. I think that's a, actually a really good limit test too. Like one of the questions founders often have is like, should I keep this? In the gap, or should that be in Pendex, right? Like, what do you cut? And if you work back to promotion, it, the answer is a lot easier. Like, what, what are people supposed to feel when, when they're looking at a thing? And if it's not something interesting, then you cut it, put it in Pendex, right? That's the longer the Pendex, basically. I know we have f five minutes left. I, I, I definitely would love to kind of tell my journey and also, um, uh, so to date, what have I raised? $85 million um, across two companies. Um, and uh, the first company was in like the, uh, a super hot market. So consider it to be like today AI. So like we were the Uber for shipping and 
uh, we, I think in, in those types of markets, it is a lot easier uh, to raise and get a lot of competition uh, on, on your deal. Um, and in like today's market, if you are not an AI, AI, AI company, um, it's really, really tough. And so like, um, and I, 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 I know like the, the, the Brian, the Brian's from Airbnb and we, we have, we've had Aaron Levy on here, uh, before, and I got to, uh, uh, get, got to know a little bit about Travis from Uber and also Ryan Graves I'm friends with. And like all of those companies, they were not in the hype cycle at all. Um, and it was actually incredibly hard for them to even raise their seed round. Um, and so, uh, you, you really, if, if you're not in like a really hot space, um, you really need to go wide. Like it, you could see talks from like Travis from Uber and like him getting like 150 no's, which I definitely have with, with air house, um, especially during this down market. And it, 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 it really is like, um, depending on your company and the, the space, like, um, if you are, if you don't have the pedigree, ped, pedigree and, and, and four companies under your belt, like Seeky, um, for everybody else, like it really is about like networking with founders, like getting intros, like building relationships up. And then just like, all it takes is just one. Yes. One. Yes. That's all you need. And so if you talk to 150 firms, all you need is that one yes, and then that could get you to like then get into a hot round and all of that. And I think that people think that like you go through YC and you and then you're you 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 get like a good like it's easy to raise money and all that. And that is not the reality at all. And the 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 biggest companies like all those three companies that I've named are all public now and they had the the like aaron levy was on the show and he said that his 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 pre-money valuation was uh, what did he say it was like uh 250k post or something like that and so like you need to have i think it goes back to exactly what Siki was saying like you need to have that conviction and you need to have that determination to really push through a lot of this stuff and sometimes like, and I also am I'm totally against the hype cycle. Like if, if I were to do ship again, I, I like, it, it just didn't really make sense, even though that it was relatively easy after the first round to raise money because we were in a very hot, hot market. But that also meant it was like crazy competitive and the union economics did not make sense and everything. And so you need to have your own point of view on how this is going to be a massive company and sometimes it's going to take a, a, a hundred meetings or something like that and you need to be prepared for that and like if it's not uh like if you if you don't get like a term sheet like as he was mentioning like it's a no like even though like i've actually had uh the investors that seem the least interested in the pitch those actually have turned out to be the ones that actually yeah. invest yeah. <laughs> um, and it's fun. very counterintuitive and so um I, I i know we're running up on time on here um but just letting people know like it's it's a it's a journey you i think seeky has great advice i actually wanted to, to get your 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 deck and your storytelling for my my own self <laughs> Uh, because it sounds like you have the, this formula that that really, but but I think it is about storytelling and, and and making people realize like how you how you what you're doing is different and how it can become like a public company. Like that's on the other side of the table. That's what everybody's thinking, and they need to be walk away from that meeting. That is like if we don't invest in this company, like we are going to be missing out on like the five or, or 10 companies that, um, of, of this year that are actually going to return anything. And so, um, I, I, I know I, I have a hard stop right now and, and I know that, that you guys have, we, we, go we, get them, 
Go get him, Kevin. You're on. We, we, <laughs> we, we all have day jobs. But also, I would mention in this environment, it's it's also different. Like, we have insane metrics. Like, I never could have actually, like, imagined the traction that we're getting right now. And the market right now is e extremely hard. And so my approach is to go wide. I'll, 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 I'll tap you. Um, uh, I already have sent emails to Siki and Sarah, uh, for, for, uh, uh, more intros, but we'll end that on, uh, we'll end this episode on that. Like everybody has their own style and everything like that you got to do what's best for your company, but you need to sell the dream. You need to sell the dream and make them really think that if they don't invest in this company, that they are going to miss out on this next biggest thing. So uh, thanks, Siki, for you, your, Siki. Your, your time and your, you. your wisdom. I'm definitely going to hit you up afterwards. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye. Bye, folks. Bye.